attracted by this idea because they're with well, their tubes and they're symmetrical and all sorts of features which seem to be promising for possibly um, having large-scale quantum states which could hold the quantum coherence for long enough that the reduction of the state is something you make use of and that's really the idea that we have. Next slide quickly and that's it. That's just a picture of a little bit more of the brain with loads and loads of microtubules. You need them all acting in some kind of concert in order to uh, have a big enough effect that you can have this orchestrated reduction actually taking place. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Yeah, thanks for being here. It's always uh, difficult to follow Roger. He's a tough act to follow. Um, I'm going to speak about uh, the neurobiology of the Orcoar theory that he mentioned. And uh, what you see behind the uh, picture is a neuron with uh, stained by immunofluorescence to show the cytoskeleton on the surfaces with a black uh, border. That's the membrane. You can see the nucleus in blue. And then the uh, yellow is uh, immunofluorescence standing for tubulin, the component of microtubules, and red is actin. So the neuron is not a bag of water. In fact, it's highly structured internally with the cytoskeleton, uh, including microtubules. Now, modern science, neuroscience, AI, and so uh, generally think of the brain as a neuronal synaptic computer. So on the this is, yeah. On the left, you see uh, a bunch of neurons interconnected by synapses. On the right, you see a computer uh, matrix with nodes. And this is generally how the uh, brain is thought of. Uh, and it's all based on the Hodgkin-Huxley integrate and fire neuron, uh, discovered or described in the 1950s by Hodgkin and Huxley. And here you see uh, a, uh, the cell body and dendrites, which receive inputs from uh, synapses and convey uh, information signals by the uh, surf surface membrane, um, by ion channels pouring uh, in and out of the membrane, conveying a signal up to a, a threshold. Uh, a, a, when the uh, a threshold is met here at the axon hillock or axon initiation segment, then a uh, all or none action potential is carried to the next uh, to the next cell. So uh, it's it's the integrate and fire idea, integrate in the uh, dendrites and soma to a threshold for firing uh, to the next uh, neuron. And most neuroscientists and AI people uh, equate uh, firing uh, with bits and as in a digital computer, and that's how they look at the brain. Uh, I don't think that's right. So integrate and fire. Now, Hodgkin Huxley uh, predicted or predicted by Hodgkin Huxley would be uh, shown on the left where you have integration here with a very fairly narrow threshold when it's met there's a uh, spiking and the spiking uh, is at an angle and I'll explain that in a second so you see you have narrow uh, temporal and uh, voltage threshold and uh, the idea is that the uh, ion channels open sequentially which is why you have the slope this is the predicted Hodgkin-Huxley integrate and fire behavior. However, if uh, you put uh, electrodes into uh, uh, pyramidal neurons of an awake animal as Nondorf and Wolf did in 2006, what you see instead is a very wide threshold, variability from spike to spike. Uh, one, uh, one spike uh, will trigger at one threshold, the next one may be higher or lower. And uh, this is shown by a, uh, a wide temporal variability and a wide voltage variability. And this is precisely where consciousness could come in to regulate behavior. Otherwise, everything is deterministic and there's no room for free will, not to mention uh, consciousness. So I've shown this as Bing, Bing, uh, not after Roger Bingham, but Bing uh, being uh, meant to be consciousness. And uh, you can see that it correlates with the uh, wide, wide variability and uh, this could come from a deeper level and uh, uh, a deeper level, uh, something like uh, um, uh, deep learning networks in AI. And uh, but a deep, a deeper level in the neuron, where where might that be? Well, it could be coming from the microtubules in the dendrites, which, as you see here, are unique, are unique, uh, uniquely uh, broken and interrupted and not continuous. And they're of mixed polarity, one pointing one way, the other next to it pointing the other way. So there are mixed polarity networks, and we think that has significance. Whereas in the axon, for example, and all other all non-neuronal cells, the microtubules are continuous and unbroken and go uh, from the cell center 
to the periphery. So it's curious why the uh, microtubules and dendrites are interrupted and of mixed polarity. Obviously, as part of the cytoskeleton, you wouldn't break your bones uh, for skeletal support. So it has to be some other reason. So the question then is, uh, does consciousness happen at the synaptic, uh, at the synapse or at the membrane, as most people think, or does it come from uh, the microtubules, uh, as, as we think, or as I think? So this also could be, as I said, like deep learning convolutional networks in AI. Now, microtubules are very interesting and important. Uh, they do many things. Uh, 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 James mentioned uh, mitosis, but in, in a neuron, here's a, a cell body, here's the axon going down here. And uh, for synaptic plasticity to adjust a synapse that may be out here or here, uh, materials are synthesized in the cell body and conveyed along uh, the dendrite by uh, these motor proteins, kinesin and dynein, which can carry uh, materials and then have to jump from microtubule to microtubule and then uh, turn left and, or right at branch points. And they have to know where to get off to deliver their cargo. They need some kind of FedEx code. And it looks like tau, a microtubule associated protein tau, which is well known for other reasons, bound at specific locations on the microtubule uh, are the traffic signals which say, hey, get, uh, leave here and, and bring your, your dopamine decarboxylase or whatever it is to this synapse because that's where, it, that's where it's needed. And uh, so tau may be a signaling, uh, the placement of tau on the microtubule may be a coding mechanism for memory and synaptic plasticity. Now also when microtubules fall apart or, and tau falls off, we get Alzheimer's disease. Everybody knows about the amyloid plaques, but it seems that the cognitive dysfunction correlates better with, uh, with uh, loss of uh, microtubules and tau and these neurofibrillary, neurofibrillary tangles, which is when the tau clumps uh, in the corners of the cell and the microtubules disassemble, the synapse is lost, the whole neuron shrivels, shrivels up and the whole brain kind of atrophies and shrinks. And uh, so treating the microtubules is a more promising, I think, uh, approach to Alzheimer's. But the microtubules themselves, uh, this suggests that they may encode memory. And this is something that struck me when I first uh, learned of them in, a, in medical school in the early 1970s in a, in a cancer lab studying mitosis. And the microtubule structure is a cylindrical uh, uh, polymer of tubulin, this peanut-shaped protein shown here in uh, two states. And I got the idea that they might be processing information like a computer. I was just learning about computers in the, in the early 70s and I had the idea that uh, tubulins might change their conformational uh, shape to represent information uh, due to dipoles uh, inside them. And working with physicists and, and engineers, I did some uh, studies uh, comparing them to, for example, the game of life, a cellular automaton game shown here, well, a very simple game with, on a grid and applied on a, uh, a orth orthogonal grid and applied them to uh, uh, the hexagonal cylindrical lattice of microtubules and showed that they could indeed process information and, and are pretty good at it with interesting uh, properties because of the cylindrical wraparound. And so uh, I published a number of papers in the, uh, in the 80s and early 90s and subsequently about classical information processing in microtubules. You can see a sequence here of one of our models of information moving through them. And then in the uh, subsequent to uh, teaming up with Roger, uh, a bunch of uh, several papers in, from the mid 90s about quantum computing in microtubules. So one thing that this would do is, um, is um, increase the capacity of information processing in the brain tremendously. For example, the standard AI singularity approach, uh, 100 billion neurons, 1,000 synapses per neuron, about 100 hertz, 10 to the 16th operations per second per brain. Uh, Kurzweil said many times, uh, give, us a brain, give us a computer with 10 to the 16th ops per second, and we'll have brain equivalents and therefore consciousness. Well, it hasn't happened. Uh, and, and it would be much more difficult, of course, if you consider the microtubule computation where one tubulant state equals one bit, where you have 100 billion neurons, um, uh, a billion tubulants per neuron at about 10 to the seventh hertz, uh, 10 megahertz, because that's the frequency of os one of the frequencies of oscillation of uh, tubulants, microtubules. This gives 10 to the 16th operations per second per neuron, the equivalent of the whole brain at the neuron level, and 10 to the 27th operations per second per brain. But uh, it didn't explain consciousness. Uh, it's just more computation. As somebody uh, confronted me when I was uh, being obnoxious in an AI meeting and saying, you guys are you know, uh, missing the target. 
And they said, okay, if you, it, let's say it is happening. How would that explain consciousness? How would that explain love, joy, feelings, emotions, uh, the so-called heart problem, which came along uh, later? And I didn't know. I was a bit stunned, and uh, I realized I had a, um, uh, something else was needed. And fortunately, this person suggested I read Roger's book, The Emperor's New Mind, which I did in about 1991. I was kind of blown away by it. And uh, he, uh, he, uh, as he said, he needed a uh, quantum computer in the brain and he didn't know of one. And I wrote to him and said, well, microtubules may be uh, what you need. And uh, we, we teamed up and uh, this is uh, us and, uh, and some other people, including Dave Chalmers on the far left at the Grand Canyon after the uh, first uh, Tucson Conference of Science of Consciousness in 1994. And we began uh, to develop our theory. Now, the first problem was that everybody said, no way, the, uh, because if you want to build a quantum computer in the laboratory, you need absolute zero temperature to avoid thermal decoherence, and the brain is too warm at 37.6 degrees. And so uh, we, we were uh, uh, skeptically uh, treated, to say the least. However, in about 2006, it was discovered that plants use quantum coherence and photosynthesis to make energy and food uh, by... Uh, superpositioned excitons propagating among these aromatic groups in this uh, uh, light harvesting complex, the FMO uh, protein it's called. And so that's been clearly shown. And uh, it turns out that the, uh, the arrangement of these uh, aromatic groups are very similar to aromatic groups in tubulin. And I'll come back to that point. So basically what we wanted to do was take the space-time qubit uh, that Roger had described where a position of a particle is, uh, position of a particle uh, is equated to its curvature in space-time, and um, and a superposition would be a separation of those curvatures. And you can imagine that were these curvatures to continue uh, uh, without collapse, that uh, each would form its own universe, and you get multiple multiple worlds. And we, but we wanted to equate that. Of course, that doesn't happen because of objective reduction. At least we don't think so. Uh, and we wanted to equate that to a, a, a qubit, a quantum bit in tubular. Now, quantum bit in quantum computing means that information can be not just one or zero, but one and zero superposition, and then collapse to one or the other as, a, as the solution. So we needed a, a qubit uh, in, the, uh, in the brain, and specifically based on tubulin pathways, not just individual. Initially, we said each tubulin was a qubit, but uh, this, uh, this allows uh, you to avoid decoherence because the tubulin pathway uh, is uh, error correcting. So the, uh, the task before us for, to develop a theory was to define the quantum bits or qubits in microtubules, and I just showed you that with the uh, pathway, and apply E sub G equals H bar over T, which uh, Roger mentioned, to microtubules to quantify or orco or conscious moments. And we also wanted to test sensitivity of microtubule quantum processes to anesthesia, which would presumably dampen the quantum processes, and psychedelics, which might be expected to enhance the quantum process in some way, and to show how orco or can account for EEG and other correlates of consciousness. So the basic idea was that we'd have a microtubule, many, many microtubules, but one shown here with the gray superposition evolving to reach threshold at a time T and having a conscious moment, a conscious now, and Bing, which was due to a process going on in the space-time geometry underlying this. It's not necessarily the space-time geometry out there. It's the space-time geometry in here uh, it, where the microtubules are. And uh, so we want to know the... Uh, 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 Sufficient orchestrated superposition occurs at time t among any among many entangled microtubules, and uh, orchestration. The idea is that, as Roger said, the proto-conscious moments that are occurring in the atmosphere uh, randomly, ubiquitously, all the time, which seems bizarre until you compare it to panpsychism, which is which is even more bizarre because that's a prop, that's a uh, state, permanent state, whereas this would be a process, a sequence of events. And, uh, but we wanted to orchestrate it. And a, a metaphor that I use is, is the, the proto-consciousness, the, the proto-conscious moments that Roger described are like, if you go to the symphony and the musicians are warming up and each one is tuning his or her instrument and you hear these random notes, and it's, it's noise, it's a cacophony. What we wanted was some system that would organize all this and orchestrate it into something more like music in terms of consciousness, having full, rich experience. So how many uh, tubulins did we need? Well, that depends on the time. And uh, 
the, the time at which collapse will occur. But first we had to decide how we were going to get E sub G out of microtubules. Was it the whole protein separated from itself? Was it at the level of atomic nuclei? Or was it the level of nucleons, the protons and neutrons? So we did the equation, we did the, uh, the, the math. Actually, Roger gave me the formula and I was uh, very keen on, on trying to go back to uh, algebra and, and mathematics. And we calculated these and we found the dominant effect would be uh, if the superposition occurred at the level of the atomic nuclei. And for that, at 40 hertz, and we picked a time T of 25 milliseconds for 40 hertz, figuring that's the best neural correlate of consciousness. We want to uh, have a conscious moment uh, 25 times a second. So this turned out to be about 2 times 10 to the 10th tubulence, which isn't really very much if there are uh, uh, a billion tubulins uh, uh, per neuron, only about 20 if all of them are used. Plus 25 milliseconds is a long time to avoid decoherence. So subsequently, when the structure of tubulin became known uh, in uh, 2009, 2010, uh, we uh, revamped the theory and considered shorter intervals time T with much larger E sub G, therefore faster frequencies, which could give rise to inter interference beats for slower processes because cognition and consciousness uh, occur hundreds of milliseconds. Uh, uh, the specious moment or uh, epochs or wh whatever paradigm you want to use or EEG uh, 10 to a uh, thousand uh, milliseconds. So we, we need to account for slower, uh, slower events and we can get that by interference speeds. Just like in music, if you have two instruments slightly out of tune, they will have interference speeds at a much slower uh, uh, frequency. Now, fortunately, uh, our cause was bolstered by the finding uh, by Anurban Banyapati, I'll show you the data in a second, but at the bottom of quantum coherence in microtubules in terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, and kilohertz frequencies. So uh, Anurban uh, looked at microtubules with uh, nanotechnology and, and, and uh, quantum, uh, looking for quantum resonances at the level of neurons with these nanoprobes at the level of an individual microtubule and at the level of tubulins and found us, uh, uh, and he would sweep the frequency, uh, stimulate with AC, uh, alternating current, and sweep the frequency and then measure conductance. And he found that at certain specific frequencies, the microtubule became highly conductive. Uh, in between those frequencies, it was a good insulator. And so he plotted the, those resonant frequencies here, and he found these self-similar uh, patterns, he calls them triplets of triplets or octaves, at the terahertz range, gigahertz, megahertz from tubulins, and then gigahertz, megahertz, and kilohertz from microtubules, and then megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz uh, from whole neurons. So uh, this is kind of like a multi-scale multi hierarchy, almost like music, and it led to this uh, general idea of a multi-scale hierarchy where we start from the neuron. Now, most neuroscientists would go uh, this way to larger uh, networks of, of, of neurons and, and regions of the brain and so forth. And that still is valid, but we also want to go downward into the microtubule, the uh, rows of tubulin, the individual dipoles, and eventually down to space-time geometry, as Roger showed, at much, much smaller scales. And here are the cell-similar patterns seen at, uh, at terahertz, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz, and hertz. And anesthesia seems to work here in the uh, terahertz range. And I'll come back to that point. So uh, we wanted to test sensitivity of microtubule quantum processes to anesthesia and also psychedelics, and, uh, and also show how orca war can account for EEG. So the easiest way, uh, in my opinion, to test uh, for a model of consciousness is how, how does it respond to anesthesia? And during the 19th century, a group of gases were discovered which, when inhaled at low concentrations, caused euphoria. So these are ether frolics, guys uh, uh, sniffing ether and getting high and giddy and dancing around. And also laughing gas, nitrous oxide was very popular. And, uh, uh, the, but when you go to a higher concentration, these are low concentrations, higher concentrations, these rendered uh, humans and animals uh, unresponsive and unconscious. The blank slide. Actually, there was supposed to be another slide there, but never mind. Um, <clears throat> So subsequent studies showed that the anesthetic gases spared non-conscious brain activity. So uh, anesthesia is fairly selective 
at, at, at inhibiting only consciousness, non-conscious activity, evoke potentials. We use evoke potentials under anesthesia to monitor spinal cord integrity and so forth. So the brain is still active under anesthesia. The only thing that's really gone is consciousness. Um, also, the, the gases uh, had, uh, the anesthetic gases uh, had different potencies and required to render uh, subjects unresponsive. But for each gas, uh, the potency for any animal studied was, was the same. At equilibrium, it would take the same amount of any anesthetic to put you or I to sleep, an an, uh, a, a, a giraffe, an elephant, a fruit fly, a salamander, all have pretty much the same uh, MAC, a minimal alveolar concentration required. That's still pretty amazing uh, that, that, that consciousness and anesthesia are, are matched so well so that um, uh, you... you it applies equally to all organisms. Now, the anesthetic gases are structurally very different. Uh, they include ethers, uh, halogenated hydrocarbons, the inert gas, xenon shown here. So chemically very different. But they have one common feature, a nonpolar region shown in gray. These are uh, filled electron uh, uh, orbitals, uh, which don't have uh, uh, charge on them, but are nonpolar, kind of like oil. And... Uh, and uh, this suggested a solubility region where anesthetics might bind. So at the turn of the 20th century, scientists sought a common factor which correlated with potency known as one over MAC, one over the minimal alveolar concentration. And they searched for the proper solubility phase in which anesthetics dissolve and bound in the body. I should say that anesthesia, anesthetic gases bind by very weak quantum forces called Van der Waals London forces, which are found and bind in all fat stores, um, uh, lipid membranes, uh, all over the place in the body. I often tell my residents that there's more anesthetic in the, in the patient's rear end than his, than his brain, but the anesthetic is nonetheless working in the brain. So why does it not affect anything except consciousness? And I think that's because the quantum forces only uh, perturb uh, systems that have uh, highly organized, highly orchestrated quantum activities. And that's what I think uh, microtubules do. So Meyer and Overton at the turn of the 20th century uh, looked at a series of gases uh, as to determine their anesthetic potency in a wide variety of animals and found that olive oil was the, the perfect solvent uh, to correlate with potency. So minimal uh, uh, alveolar concentration or MAC the lower you go on this, the, the uh, more potent the anesthetic. So the most potent anesthetic is methoxyfluorine at 0.25%, and nitrogen is an anesthetic at 50 or 60 atmospheres. So, uh, and down here are where the clinically relevant an uh, anesthetics are. Now, there are also a couple of outliers in the Meyer Overton. These two gases, TFMB and F6, which don't cause, which bind in the same place, but don't cause anesthesia. So a good theory should explain why they do not. But first, the solubility phases uh, of, a, of the body can be shown here. And as you go this direction, you become more polar. And this is nonpolar. So this is oil and this is water. And as you know, oil and water don't mix. So what they found was that uh, uh, the anesthetic action occurred and therefore consciousness occurred in the highly nonpolar regions, olive oil-like regions, uh, which correlated with dimethylbenzene, methylbenzene, and benzene, which are basically uh, uh, organic chemistry. Uh, it was known in the 17th century that the, the hydrocarbons of uh, hydrogen and carbon uh, could be in two different uh, forms, uh, CnH2n plus 2 or CN2n, depending on whether there was a double bond or not. But then they had C6H6, and they didn't know what it was. Uh, they didn't know what the structure was. And then Kekulé, a uh, Dutch chemist, had a dream that these uh, hydrocarbons were like snakes and one of them swallowed its tail and uh, it formed a ring. And this is also known as the Ouroboros. And so he got the idea. He woke up and said, ah, benzene is a ring structure. And sure enough, he's right. These six carbons uh, make this hexagon. There's three extra uh, electrons. Uh, and it's often shown by this, uh, this uh, uh, figure right here of a hexagon with three extra uh, bonds. Now, what happens is that the electrons uh, in the pi orbitals co coalesce uh, into these uh, rings or pi uh, cloud, electron cloud, covering the whole molecule. And this is a cloud of delocalized electrons, therefore conducive to quantum uh, effects, including uh, magnetic, electric ma magnetic dipole oscillations, excitons, charge transfer, phonons, fluorescence, and so forth. 
So this is where quantum stuff can happen, uh, regardless of the temperature. Now these benzene rings or phenyl rings will attract each other by van der Waals forces because the, this uh, electron cloud dipole here repels this one, and then they oscillate at 10 to the 12th uh, hertz. So, uh, and then they can form quantum superposition. So this gives terahertz oscillations. And uh, the pi resonance groups are also uh, significant in terms of effects on consciousness because the neurotransmitters, dopamine and serotonin, the pleasure molecule and the mood molecule, as well as all the psychedelics, LSD, DMT, and psilocybin, have these very large pi resonance groups. So something's going on here with consciousness and pi resonance. So the basic idea about anesthesia is that the oscillations of some uh, pi resonance groups in the brain uh, go on when you're conscious, and then anesthesia comes in, and by dipole dispersion, uh, uh, dampens the oscillations and causes loss of consciousness. The question is, where in the brain, where in the brain does this happen? Uh, it, used to, it was thought initially anesthetics bind in lipids because of their fat solubility, but it turns out they act directly in proteins. And these guys, Nick Franks and Bill Lieb, found this in the 1980s that they can act directly in uh, inside uh, inside proteins in nonpolar regions, which have these aromatic rings. Uh, they call them hydrophobic pockets composed of pi resonance rings, uh, uh, composed of amino acids, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. And so it was assumed that anesthetics act on membrane receptors and ion channels, but after about 20 years of study, uh, there were no, no sense could be made of anesthetic effects on membrane proteins. Uh, GABA receptors, uh, 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 serotonin, glycine, acetylcholine receptors all bind anesthetics, but one will open them, the other, another anesthetic will, will close the channel. Some don't bind all the channels, so there's no unitary effect. So membrane uh, proteins, despite their obvious candidacy, since they, they are responsible for excitability of membranes, uh, are not the site of action of anesthetics, it looks like. Uh, Eckenhoff's group uh, did a number of studies uh, uh, in... Uh, kind of all looking systemically, systematically, and, and found, for example, 70 uh, uh, proteins in, in the neuron that binds, anesth binds anesthesia, anesthetics, about half in the membrane, half in the cytoplasm. And doing proteomics and genomics, uh, they pointed to tubulin in microtubules as the most likely uh, site. These other proteins also, but they're not in any signaling pathway. Uh, they also did a study on tadpoles where they used this fluorescent anesthetic anthracene, which is only anesthetic when it gets illuminated by UV light. They gave it to these tadpole, tadpoles, let them swim around, and then because tadpoles have conveniently transparent heads, they illuminate them with ultraviolet light and they went belly up and they were anesthetized. And when they ground up their brains after uh, tadpoles donated, donated them to science, they found that the anthracene was, was uh, bound to uh, tubulin, to microtubules. So uh, this study that I'll just touch on briefly, Travis Craddock and colleagues and myself uh, modeled uh, all 80, so tubulin shown here has 86 aromatic amino acids, uh, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. And here's also the, uh, the anesthetic uh, molecules where they bind. And we, uh, we simulated uh, quantum dipole couplings among all 86 of these and found a spectrum uh, at KT at room temperature uh, a spectrum of collective dipoles, dipole oscillations with a common mode peak at about 613 uh, terahertz in the blue-green region of the spectrum. All the, and then we added anesthetics, and all the anesthetics abolished the 613 terahertz peak and dampened all frequencies proportional to anesthetic potency. Non-anesthetic gases that I mentioned, which bind in the same place but do not cause loss of consciousness, did not alter the terahertz spectrum. So microtubule terahertz oscillations are an intraneural correlate of consciousness. So the non-anesthetics had no such effects. Why not? We looked at the we looked at the polarizability of all the of all the anesthetics and the non-anesthetics, and we found that the non-anesthetics had higher polarizability. So we think uh, the anesthetics uh, bind and disperse the dipoles, whereas the non uh, non-anesthetics are so highly polarizable, they go along for the ride. They oscillate right along with the system. So that's our, uh, that's our explanation for why uh, uh, the non-anesthetics don't have anesthetic efficacy, despite being at the same place. Uh, so here's the blue-green uh, uh, region of the spectrum, where, which is produced in the tubulins. And uh, 
just a couple uh, uh, comments here that the, these pi resonance rings, pi stacks, remember there's 86 of them in tubulin at, at, at a certain number of angles. And there's only two stable angles, a T-shape and a parallel displaced. And it could be that the, these positions correlate with qualia, with feelings. Now, this is uh, uh, obviously a bit of a joke, but, it, but qualia and feelings have to come from somewhere. And it could be that if there's a superposition and then of, of these positions, and then it collapses to a T-shape, that's a bad feeling. And if it, to the parallel displaced, it's a good feeling. Uh, qu uh, speculation, obviously, but um, uh, uh, qualia have to come from somewhere. So we have uh, 86 of these in, uh, in tubulin. So maybe uh, this is where quality are coming from. And uh, it might be something like 86 factorial possible feelings coming from one tubulin. And then you got a lot of them in the brain. So uh, this is a possibility, but it would involve collapsing or objective reduction, orchestrated objective redu reduction to these particular configurations. So um, uh, here's the, uh, the general scheme again, that we have a multi-scale hierarchy and consciousness or orca war can occur uh, in the terahertz or slower and uh, kind of move around maybe even like music and possibly extending down uh, to Planck scale geometry. Uh, finally, I want to mention that uh, we just concluded a meeting in Tucson. Roger came over uh, from uh, Oxford for that. Uh, the Templeton Foundation, Templeton World Charity Foundation, has a project accelerating research on consciousness uh, promoting what they call adversarial collaboration between or among theories. So uh, we were named one of the six uh, major theories and uh, we could uh, pick uh, 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 another, one of the other ones. And uh, so I picked uh, the integrated information theory of Giulio Tononi and Christoph Koch, who, which is probably the best known theory. Uh, they're very well known neuroscientists. And uh, they have this integrated information theory with this parameter called phi, which is a me measure of integration and, and cause effect. And uh, so I designed a bunch of experiments that were uh, supposed to distinguish between our theory and their theory. And one of them, for example, was show, demonstrate quantum vibrations in microtubules, then uh, use anesthesia and see if it's dampened, see if the quantum vibrations are dampened. Uh, and then do different anesthetics and compare their potency. So if an anesthetic is twice as potent putting you to sleep, uh, it should require, uh, uh, compared to another one, it sh you should need ha uh, half as much uh, to, uh, to cause, to dampen the, uh, the oscillations and quantum vibrations. And uh, Christoph said uh, he didn't buy that. And I said that would, uh, that would falsify IIT. He said, no, it wouldn't because IIT can, can apply to... Um, quantum vibrations in microtubules, or phi can apply to quantum vibrations in microtubules, uh, which means it's pretty vague and, and pretty non nonspecific and can apply to almost uh, anything. And Scott Aronson pointed out it could apply uh, to a thermostat uh, to be conscious. So uh, we'll see how that goes. We're gonna propose a, uh, these experiments and, uh, uh, and the loser supposedly gets eliminated and the winner moves on to face another theory, kind of like uh, NFL playoffs coming up. So uh, some new things that came out was magnetic uh, uh, vortices from uh, Anur bon Bandyapati, where uh, microtubules generate these magnetic vor uh, vortices, which can interact with others uh, to form something like a hologram. Uh, we have evidence now from Horacio Cantiello that microtubules oscillate at 40 hertz. That might be the origin of EEG. EEG has been around for 100 years, but we really don't know its origin or its significance and why we have these frequency bands. And we think it's coming as a beat frequencies from, mic from microtubules inside. Um, we're designing experiments for quantum vibrations in microtubules. And the mixed polarity uh, networks and dendrites are proving to be very important. So we're going to look at them more closely. So in conclusion, uh, quantum vibrations in microtubules support the orc -OR theory that Roger and I developed. Uh, by e, e sub g equals h over t. They are testable and could be therapeutic targets for mental and cognitive disorders. A number of things came out in the meeting suggesting that uh, aspects of microtubules in, in brain neurons correlate with various disease states. And uh, other people are trying to use ultrasound into the brain to resonate microtubules to treat Alzheimer's and brain trauma and so forth. Uh, anesthetics prevent consciousness by dampening uh, quantum terahertz vibrations in microtubules inside neurons and psychedelics may enhance such vibrations. We, we hope to test that also in the Templeton project. And finally, uh, cortical layer five pyramidal neurons are probably the best 
site of uh, best bet for consciousness. Not to say that it can't be in other neurons. Uh, these are large, they have large pyramid shaped arrays of mixed polarity networks and, account, and can account for EEG. And I mentioned there are no pyramidal cells in the cerebellum because one of the big claims of IIT is that phi is very low in the cerebellum and cerebellum has more neurons than cortex but isn't conscious. And I think it's more simply explained by the fact that um, it doesn't have pyramidal cells. And finally, let me mention that uh, we have a conference in Tucson every two years, the Science of Consciousness. It's been going on since 1994. The next one uh, will be held in uh, April. And uh, you, can, you can look it up or uh, let us know and we'll send you uh, some information about it. It's gonna be very interesting. Thank you very much.